Hey guys, this is the pre-intro to the intro because I failed to mention that I would greatly appreciate a favor. I have the opportunity to help wellness professionals make a deeper impact in their work by providing the tangible and practical steps to move into the next generation of wellness. So that means away from the biomedical model incentives and weight loss contest to a more integrated approach that really embeds wellness throughout the nooks and crannies of the organization. And I have found that there is an extreme gap between what everyone is theorizing about what we should do and then what actually happens in the organizations. So that's why Rebecca Johnson and I develop the training in February that we'll have. But this opportunity is to bring it to the Wellcoa Summit. And they are crowdsourcing the all of the sessions that are up for um, the opportunity to get in. And you can vote. You can vote for our next generation wellness training through Wellcoa's website. I am going to make it easy on you. And if you're listening to this in iTunes or Stitcher, then you can just click on the link. Or if you're listening to it on my website, then you there's a link there to vote. So if you don't mind taking two seconds to go vote for Rebecca and I to present at this next year's and 2019's wellness summit, I would greatly appreciate it. All right, now here's the intro. Hello, and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. If you are listening to this live and you're in the US, then happy Thanksgiving, which is tomorrow. Now, if you are not listening to this live, then it could have passed. It could be summer for all I know. So I hope whenever your Thanksgiving is, if you celebrate it, then you have a happy one. On to today's guest, Lisa Kelly. I've seen Lisa now and again on LinkedIn, and and I tried to listen to a podcast that she was on. I'm not going to name the title of the podcast, but I I couldn't listen. I tried, uh, but the host was in an airport, and there was constant announcements behind them, and I couldn't really hear what Lisa was saying. I was so distracted, but I was very impressed with Lisa, who was just a class act through it all. I think she even said, do you, do you think we should reschedule for another time? And the host was like, no, no, let's keep powering through. I couldn't listen. But uh, she's a very kind person and, and she's built quite an online presence for herself. Let me give you a little bit about her bio. Her company is Kelly Wellness Consulting, and she's been cultivating healthy changes within workplaces and with personal clients for over 20 years. Her mission is to create an innovative and collaborative landscape for global workplace wellness that fosters employee-driven, results-oriented wellness solutions benefiting employers, employees, and communities at large. Lisa offers global online delivered programs featuring dynamic experiential training and workplace wellness program design and delivery. Her interactive programs provide a supportive and cost-effective approach to developing healthy and engaged workforces. And Lisa's got quite a Facebook group going on. Um, It's got quite a few members in it, and um, I'll link it up in the show notes as well. And some of you are in both my Redesigning Wellness Community Facebook group and then hers as well, which is cool. In this interview, I asked Lisa about her experience in toxic workplaces, so her own experience before she actually started her company. Some challenges that she faces with her clients are what her ambassadors face in their organizations or with their clients, her approach to wellness, and I was getting curious about, is she changing anything now that the Wellcoa benchmarks have changed and Wellcoa is evolving some items with their benchmarks and they just redefine wellness and I guess not redefined it. They defined it like an actual definition that you can refer to. And uh, because I was reading that with Lisa, that her, some of the programs she have are built on Wilco's benchmarks. So you can hear her answer. Now, before we dive into the interview, I just want to let you know that I'm doing a small training right now with seven wellness professionals, and it is awesome. It's really fun. Um, We're in our third session, and so we've got three more to go. And I'm very impressed with the innovation, the drive of the people in the session who are, you know, having some conversations that are a little bit uncomfortable so they can try to get to the root cause of kind of what's going on in their workplace. And in one example is that um, a wellness professional is being asked, you know, kind of do these stress management programs and you can only do so much as a wellness professional if the environment is stressful, right? 
And the topic that we talked about this past week was on leadership and the the importance of leadership when it comes to employee well-being. And so it was a really good session. So we talked about just all the facts and figures around leadership and the connection to well-being, engagement, and productivity. And then next week, we're going to talk about recommendations in the real world. Like, so what can you actually do when you're coming up against um, maybe some poor management and maybe an organization that doesn't want to hear about it or do anything about it. So it's been a fun group and I may do it again. Who knows? But if you are interested in, you know, joining a training, the, the nine week training that I'm going to have with Rebecca Johnson in February, you can check everything out on my website at redesigningwellness.com. There's a webpage that is a description of the, the whole training and then that web page is called impact and influence and you can also download the course outline there so you can see what we're going to be talking about as well as if you have any questions just um, put in a request into the contact form i'm happy to get back to you and if and i mentioned too the facebook group if you want to come join us on facebook you can go search the redesigning wellness community i ask you a couple questions just to make sure you're not a bot and then welcome you into our group it's an awesome group the people there are so supportive and so helpful and come join us without further ado let's dive into my interview with lisa kelly as always thank you so much for listening to the redesigning wellness podcast Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, corporate wellness consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Lisa Kelly, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness podcast. I'm so glad to have you on. Thank you for having me, Jen. Well, I'd love to just start with kind of how you started and you created your company after years of working for and with highly stressed, toxic workplaces. Just tell us a little bit about those experiences and kind of what led up to starting your own company. Yeah, well, you know, that's a really great place place to start. And so thanks for asking. So over the years in my, you know, I've worked, I have a pretty eclectic background. I've worked a lot in corporate and public uh, sectors with government, have had several of my own businesses. But in my last job with the social service department, it, I noticed the workers becoming extremely stressed due to budget and stuff, short staff shortages. Now, this was probably eh, about 10 years or so. You know, and, and I'm, I, I know we all experience these things today still, you know, between budget shortages, staff shortages, and what have you. But um, at the time, I was also working in the evening part-time with a home-based business as a personal trainer and nutritionist. And I really felt I was having far more impact in that role in a more proactive way than I was as an employment career counselor in my job with government. So, um, and I think for me, the really the writing was on the wall when one day a hostile client who was turned down for benefits literally threw a computer across the room in one of our offices. And I think it was at that time I realized my skills and talents would be far better utilized and served in a more proactive role working as a full-time wellness consultant. So I really decided to dedicate my energies as a full-time nutritionist and personal fitness consultant, which then years later I became evolved into and involved in workplace wellness consulting. And this field has really enabled me to combine and fully utilize my corporate training backgrounds. I used to be a corporate trainer in HR and in development and my business degree and master's in adult education. And of course, my nutrition and personal training and stress mastery and all the other skills and training I've done over the years. And because my my passion really has been, you know, all along in personal well-being, nutrition development and what have you. So it really was the best decision, and every day I get to do what I love, and I get to see a positive difference in the lives of those that I get to serve and support. So yeah, I guess that's probably in a nutshell a little bit about me and how I evolved into workplace wellness. Now, was the the employee the the one um, throwing the computer across the room? Was it was that like the, the the straw that broke the camel's back, or were there a series of moments that were going? I think it was a series, really, um, leading up to that. And I just, the joy wasn't there for me in that job. And I really felt much more passionate working at home in my home-based business. And I really wanted, I was getting demands, you know, for more hours. And so I really wanted to dedicate myself to that. And, um, and then we moved. And then again, I re, uh, started my business in another city and it just went from there. 
Well, you know, given you, know, your, you said your experience in fitness and nutrition, I'm very curious about your company or your own wellness, well-being philosophy, whichever one you go by. Tell me a little bit about, I guess, what you choose or do you interchange the words and, and what's your philosophy? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I just did an article and one of my advisors, you know, in our company, we don't make a real distinction between wellness and well-being. We use them interchangeably. And so when you speak of a philosophy and you were asking about this question, I really came to think about our current company, our Kelly Wellness Consulting, and, you know, all that, our vision, our mission, our core objectives, you know, that we co-created as a KWC associate team and what that all meant in terms of philosophy. And really, you know, our philosophy, we're really dedicated to providing high impact, employee driven, high commitment, workplace wellness solutions. And knowing that the change has to come from within at Kelly Wellness um, with the support of those that we train and work with, we really focused on developing and delivering programs that involve employees in the development right from the outset. And that's really helped foster uh, personal and corporate growth and success for our clients, for their employees and our ambassadors. And so, you know, I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at in terms of philosophy. I guess I probably should have questioned you on that. But when you asked that question, that's the first thing that, you know, came to mind was our vision and our mission and what we do and why we do it. So more in the way of how, how do you define wellness or well-being? Because right now, you know, while COAs um, has changed, not changed or defin- definition, they've actually defined it in a certain way. Wellness has a standard definition. You know, well-being is used in all sorts of different ways. So more of what do you, what are the factors that encompass kind of wellness or well-being? Well, you know, and again, it's an interesting question because it just comes to mind, what comes to mind is an article I just wrote recently. You know, there's a lot of discussion right now in corporate wellness around around are we too focused today on the physicality the physical side of wellness right and our programs in some cases are not as multi-dimensional and comprehensive in breadth and scope as they should be so I actually just wrote an article on this in my LinkedIn and talking about multi-dimensional programs and so I think you know when we look at the concept of wellness or well-being part of the issue we've been struggling with in the years is just as I said we've been focused focus too much on the physicality and so in our programs for example we look at all the dimensions of well-being or wellness or whatever you want to call it today from you know the psychological the social the emotional the intellectual the career the community the family and we involve that in all our training and you know throughout the breadth of our programs because we really want our trainings for example to really go out into the workforce recognizing and embracing the merits of developing the employee as a whole right their, their total well-being if you will and so I think that's a really a key area. And it's interesting because, you know, as I said, my background's in fitness and nutrition. However, I have, you know, I have a Stephen Covey Seven Habits instructor and, and all other areas. And so I've got a stress mastery background. So I have a really eclectic background. And so I really try and bring that into our program and really infuse it and get our trainees, for example, when they go work with employers and client organizations or their own organization to really, um, you know, do a broad scope with their employees and employers in terms of what the needs and interests are. And, um, you know, maybe it might be financial well-being, right? So really to look outside the box, because, you know, a lot of us tend to think, as I said, nutrition, fitness, maybe emotional well-being, you know, case in point in one of our programs there last year, our level two, they developed group certification projects. And so one of them did a project warm-up. Uh, for seniors, which involves bringing seniors and employees together. So you're embracing corporate social responsibility, community well-being, right? And bringing those other elements of well-being into the organization. Because as we know, when we're involved in doing something for others, that volunteering capacity does a lot to develop and enhance our own personal well-being and our emotional well-being. So it all is all interplays, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you for the example about bringing employees and seniors together. That's a very uh, interesting example. Um, you know, one of the things that you said earlier is that employees are developed in the outset. Can you mm-hmm. describe how that process works or a little bit more about that? Give me another yeah. example, maybe. When you were going through kind of your list of kind of the company oh, yeah. and mission and that type of thing, you mentioned one of the things that you said was that the employees are involved in the development from the outset. Right. So. Absolutely. So, you know, to that question then, if I may, because a lot of my reference points, of course, come from my program. So apologize if I'm kind of shamelessly plugging here, but it's, it's really it's the world I live in, right? So, um, you know, with our programs, for example, um, we have a wellness buddies program and a wellness champion program, which are 
two modules that our trainees, our ambassadors in our level one get to use. And the reason I bring that up is because through those modules, when they're working with employers and once they determine the needs with an organization, then they have done for you wellness buddies and wellness champion programs. They're completely done modules that they can go to an organization and train the employees in these areas. And then through that, it, it creates engagement, right? It creates great engagement. It creates interest by the employees as to, you know, personal wellness for them and organizational wellness. And then from there, you get them trained, you get them engaged, you maybe get them excited, knowledgeable about workplace wellness. And then you have a pool of resources or talents to bring in to say a wellness committee. So everything we do as ambassadors, it's, you know, really pro- programs done with employees for and by employees. And so we get them involved as employees. So our, our model is quite unique and we're probably maybe even a little bit of ahead of the curve in some respects in terms of, you know, how we operate with employers, but it really does create much more effective and engaging and employee-driven focused programs through the resources and training that we, you know, we model, I guess, in our program, right? Yeah, and this may be a dense question, but you're, you're training the, the wellness about the employees and the population. Are you training them in, on what? Like the, the importance of wellness or kind of the, the bigger picture of wellness? Or? Well, everything. And so when they come in through our first level, we do cover off the elements and different dimensions of wellness and they get done for you lunch and learns and other resources like the wellness champion program, the training program. So they learn presentation skills. They learn how to basically work with employers. But then at the master level, that's where we really get into the program planning and development. And they learn how to do assessments. They learn how to do evaluations. They learn how to develop campaigns. They actually develop a campaign as a group for their certification. And so through the two levels, and then we have other programs as well, but through those two levels, they become fully trained, skilled, and through very hands-on experiential learning, through our group discussions online and what have you, and the sharing of stories and support. Because some come into the program with some exact experience as a workplace wellness leader or coordinator, and some are completely new. You know, there may be a wellness enthusiast just looking to get into workplace wellness. So everyone brings their unique perspectives and experiences to the group. And so that, and then we also use Laura Putnam's book. That's our, one of our textbooks. And we have nine modules full with toolkits and resources in addition to the modules. So, you know, again, um, all of those bring together a really a comprehensive approach, I guess, to training our ambassadors to then go out to their, you know, client employers, if they're consultants or coaches or independent, or to their own organizations, because we have a split between people who work within organizations who are trained up to want to develop workplace wellness programs within their organization, or as I said, those who want who are consultants or coaches, independents, some are concierges, and they go out and work with um, employers in that capacity. And they develop programs or maybe go and do lunch and learns or wellness campaigns or various other initiatives based on what the needs and interests are of the organization and, of course, their employees, right? Mm-hmm. Now, now, since your company works with global global companies, so cl- companies <coughs> outside of North America, have you noticed any challenges that maybe those companies face or anything that you've noticed that is outside of North America versus what other challenges they face here in North America? You know, um, I don't sense, I mean, there are some challenges and actually I'm just, I had some notes prepared on this, you know, when we're talking about companies outside North America and in our information webinar, we actually talk on this very thing. And for example, in a 2014 Towers Watson Staying at Work report, they looked at a whole spectrum of countries. And so I'm just like looking at the chart now. So, for example, um, uh, workplace health culture and w- was pretty consistent across the companies. And so when I thought about that in terms of challenges our ambassadors face and what's happening you know, globally, Um, And there may be even two different questions here, but just talking specifically about what's happening from a global scene, right, with workplace wellness. And so just to speak to that, then top priorities for most countries today on the whole are things like cultivating healthy work culture, you know, health engagement and mental health. Um, Safety factored in in Europe, that came number one as a priority in Europe. But on the whole, workplace health culture, uh, which was, you know, pleasing to see that they're focused on the big picture now, right? We have to cultivate a healthy wellness culture. And from there, then, you know, things like senior wellness champions that are senior leaders and others, uh, aspects of developing healthy employees fall into place when we have the foundation that I call it, right, established. But in terms of challenges, and I thought about, for example, because I largely work, you know, through my ambassadors now with companies. And so 
the challenges that, say, our ambassadors face are probably not much different different than challenges that other wellness coordinators or independent consultants may experience. And so I think the number one challenge still today is educating management on the importance of dedicating resources, both, you know, human capital and financial resources in corporate wellness. And of course, in dedicating them and investing them in their employees on a whole spectrum of areas. And then also another challenge, I think, still that our ambassadors, and I know others experience, and we're going to actually be doing some focus groups for our book around this very topic starting next week for anyone who might like to sign up for our focus group. But it's getting the senior leaders involved as senior wellness champions, and that's going to be a whole chapter within our book. And getting them to participate in events and having them become those role models, right, for employees. And interestingly, I just read another report recently by the Future Wellness of Work by Global Wellness Institute. And the millennials were saying that this is something, um, millennials and also the Gen X boomers were saying this is an area that they really want to see from their senior leaders. They want to see them be role models. You know, if you're asking me to show up for lunch and learn, I want to see you there too. <laughs> you know, I want to see you participate in those uh, walking uh, events we have or the walking meetings, right? So they really want them literally to walk the talk and be the role models. And so that's an area that we really need to do more in. And that's one of the reasons we're actually developing our executive wellness leadership program and launching it next year is because we really feel this is an untapped area that we really need to cultivate and hone within the senior leadership of organizations. And Another challenge by our ambassadors, and I know from talking with other independents especially, is how to connect with HR and the senior leaders to really market themselves for workplace wellness opportunities. And I do, I have, I publicly, I moderate, sorry, public groups, and that's the number one question, right, is how can I get out, how can I connect, how can I connect with senior leaders, how can I connect with HR? And so, I, of course, I mean, I'm, I have programs, so I have to, you know, politely defer them to consider our program. Mind you, I do give away tips and strategies and Facebook Lives in our public groups. But, but it is, it is, you know, I could spend all day doing consults with, with, eight, with wellness consultants on how to, you know, make those connections, right? And I'll just say to anyone listening, because they're probably waiting for an answer, that there's no quick fix. There's no easy answer. It really takes a process. It takes relationship building um, with those, you know, stakeholders, right? To make those connections to get into the company, right? And sometimes that relationship building can take four to six months, but sometimes even longer. Yes, the relationship is the key and focusing on the relationship first and then the, what you're trying to... Absolutely, and we yeah. say in social media, right? Build that no like trust factor, right? Because why should company X hire or bring me in? Even as a trainer in my programs, as established as they are and as successful as we are, every day I have to go out and build that relationship, get them to know me, to like me, and to trust me, right? Before I ask them to train some of their employees in our programs. Yes, absolutely. And sometimes that comes with time. <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, and a lot of elbow grease. I mean, I literally get on LinkedIn every day for a couple hours, and I reach out to people, and I, you know, make calls, we make connections, and we build relationships. I send them educational material, and, you know, it is a grind, but it's it's well worth it. It's well worth it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's part of open, uh, owning your own company, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't understand, and I think it, it, when, when, you, when you're working in a job and you want to go off on your own, I think people... We don't talk about that enough, how much Mm -hmm. it can be a grind and how much you're constantly having to make sure that you're networking, building relationships, getting sales. Yeah, but you know, it does get easier, I should say that, and the support. And, and you know, again, um, just maybe if I may come back to our program, when you're part of a recognized organization and you have some solid training before, you know, in front of you or behind you, that can really serve you well. But all that being said, as we said, you still need to go. You still need to do that that legwork, right? And that that just, you know, get in there and do it and build relationships. And there's a number of ways you can do that creatively and respectfully. The one thing I would say to people, and that's just a little throw out there, um, and then you probably get it yourself, Jen, is when we get all these messages from LinkedIn and they send you a whole page right from their website and their URLs, well, don't do that, <laughs> really, because it's not going to serve you in any way, shape, or form. It's just go on and find something in their profile. If it's an HR person, find something that you can comment about their employer, their company, some something they're doing maybe in the wellness space, and really compliment that on, in a genuine way, right? And then start building a relationship, getting to know them before you start pitching them. And I, I made this mistake when I first started, I would be pitching my programs and they're like, who's Lisa Kelly? <laughs> you know? And I still got to be careful not to do that. Right. Because it's, that's a natural tendency. Right. 
So we still got to get in there and just be, be personal, right? And, and make it about them. Yes, make it about them. I think that is the very first thing. Serve before you worry about yourself. Just absolutely show some value. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned that you guys have a pretty holistic approach, and, and you mentioned that. But how have you seen that? I guess evolve in companies that you work with. Well, you know, as I alluded to earlier, there is was and probably still is to some degree a focus around the physical, the, you know, the physical side of that physical well being dimension, if you will, of all the dimensions and well being or wellness or whatever you want to call it, and. So I think I've already alluded to some, but I'm really starting to recognize through the work I'm doing with our program and our ambassadors, more recognition that I spoke to earlier about multidimensional wellness programs. And so I'm seeing our employers, our, excuse me, our ambassadors, you know, have from requests from the employers they're working with or their own you know, employer, you know, requesting for things like emotional well-being, digital detox, stress mastery, family well-being, um, even using one of our ambassadors who works internally as a wellness leader um, uses social causes and involves them as part of their workplace wellness program. So they'll do things like the United Way plane pull, pull or the big bike race with an MS, I believe, or they'll do breast cancer awareness events and they'll make them fun physical events. So then you're, you know, you're meeting that physical dimension, right? But you're also doing that CSR, that corporate social responsibility and community well-being dimension. So you're, and maybe others as well, you know, the social and emotional well-being that comes from bonding and doing fun things with your co workers right mm-hmm. so these are some things we're starting to see emerge as i mentioned um the project's warm-up with seniors that's a community well-being initiative so we're starting to see as i said earlier more community type of focuses um some are doing that i notice in the states not so much in canada because we don't have the growing climate but in the u.s they're doing um employee rooftop gardens and you might have heard of that right or community gardens so they're giving the food back to the community but they're getting out they're getting the fresh air they're actually you know moving their bodies gardening if you will right so that's another initiative that's a little bit different and it's um you know moving to a more holistic approach and and broadening out to really be multi-dimensional in scope and also as i mentioned earlier Really, I think there still needs to be more effort and attention to cultivating those senior wellness champions among the senior leaders and managers that we're working with. And so, as I mentioned, we're developing that executive wellness leadership program. But even in one of our past projects in our level two, one of our group projects, they developed a healthy habits for busy managers. And they're all different modules, module based that they as ambassadors can use with companies to train their managers around, you know, healthy habits. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can get into companies because I think when we bring those senior leaders and get them involved and bring them on board, that's half the battle, right? That's half the battle. So if we can do that, then we're, we're, we're there. We're almost there, right? And then from there, they will start things like, you know, we do this as marketing strategies in our program as part of our training is having CEOs do voice announcements or show up at events or do um, an email announcement about a lunch and learn that's coming up or a wellness campaign or some other initiative. But really, having them seen and also having them participate in kickoff events or other, you know, uh, on-site campaigns. And as I said earlier, you know, those millennials, they want to see those senior leaders there, right? And it really does serves it well for team building, right? And opening up communications and creating a fun and relaxing environment where everyone can just let their hair down uh, between management and employees. And that goes a long way. And I've been involved in cultural development through HR and my training background. And it doesn't take a lot, right, to sort of break that ice and um, start forging those those relationships uh, in a fun way that we can't always do, you know, in a structured confines of a staff meeting or a, a work initiative, right? Yeah, you know, when you mentioned senior senior leaders, I know that's, that's often a, a barrier that many wellness professionals can't seem to connect the dots with the, the senior leaders. I think in my experience, I have most of the the barriers with middle management as well. Mm-hmm. I've seen yeah. the majority yeah. of it. The senior yeah. leaders have been fully on board with it, but it's like this middle that just... No, absolutely. And, you know, that's a good point. So even with our executive, we're calling executive program, but it will, we'll probably have as much or more senior or, or 
our middle managers, because we're going to take, you know, a middle manager into the program as well or appeal to them for that very reason. And, and the reason being is our middle managers, and I used to work in HR and I, I've got this all the time. Our middle managers are those who, you know, they have, they're not the executives sitting in, you know, their executive meetings doing the strategic planning. They're, you know, they're boots on the ground managers oftentimes, and they have deliverables, right, that they have to meet. And so they sometimes, we get on this roller coaster, right, and this treadmill of life as managers or as just individuals. We can't see the forest for the trees, and we just think, oh, I can't allow my employee to go to a lunch and learn or whatever. I got to get this done. But what they fail to realize is that that hour away, that reprieve for that employee will pay back in dividends. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to the choir. You know this, right? Mm-hmm. But it'll pay back in dividends, and they'll be so much more innovative and brighter and uh, productive, you know, especially mid-afternoon when we hit that slump, Right. And so going and doing a fun lunch and learn or even organizing it for the employees or organizing a fun event, whether it's not even a wellness event, but something that allows them just to have a bit of fun and let their hair down, as I said, then th- this is a message we need to be educating and working with and impressing upon our senior or middle managers, right? That, yeah. yes, we can let our employees go. We need to let them go, right? Well, I mean, it shows the value, too. Oh, uh, absolutely. Value. I'm hearing some really horrific things, and I don't know. Maybe I'm you know late to the party on this, but I was reading or listening to a, something recently about um it was a podcast talking about um or no sorry maybe simon cynic's book i don't know anyway i read so much and hear so much but they were talking about the cab turnarounds like with some of these high-tech companies in silicon valley or whatever where the employees are literally working all nighters they get a cab they drive home they shower and the cab waits in the driveway and they bring them back to work Mm. right I mean, I was like, oh, wow, is this really, is this what's happening? Is this what we've evolved to today? I'm hoping that's the minimal. I mean, I I hope that's that's an exception, not the norm. Absolutely. I mean, that is, yeah, I don't know anyone that would uh, tolerate that. Yeah, but you know, but if that's happening, but that's what I'm saying is that, and the other thing about the, you know, it's not being able to disconnect. I've had, I had one client actually call me up, a potential client called me up, said, we need help in our organization. I have, I go home and I have a manager. My manager calling me up at nine because I can't, I have a cell phone, right? And that's what happens. Texting me or calling me at nine looking for answers to his questions at night when I'm trying to get my child to sleep. Mm-hmm. So we've still got a lot of work to do, right? <laughs> as wellness leaders. We, we do, but I think it's funny that they would look to somebody outside to do it because I think a lot of times we shy away from a, a conversation that needs, needs to happen. Like they, that person is probably not a psychologically safe environment where he can say, hey, you know, at nine o'clock I put my kids to bed. Is there something, you know, because yeah. that, that has happened to a coworker that his, um, his boss would call him every day at the same time. It was like seven o'clock, same time. It was like dinner time with his kids. And right. Like, oh. <laughs> this is not working for me. I do have a family. Um, I know. You know but, but we can't all just jump ship and go to a new job, right? Because, you know, you, you may be going out of the fat into the fire, right? No, you can't and, and for the benefit of the other employees, we need to, we can't just say, okay, well, let's, let's leave, leave that job. Because let's face it, there's not a lot of jobs out there to go to these days. And we, we don't want to do that. So we really wait, need wait, to first wait, wait, and foremost. I, okay, so just. Two things, real quick, real quick, before you go down that track. I, I didn't think that you could just jump ship, but more on okay. to have the conversation around it. Okay. Um, but right now, it's a really hot job market, so there are tons of jobs for people to go to. I mean, like, well, yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, I guess it, it depends, um, you know, where you're located, too. I guess some areas are a little more robust in, in jobs than others, right, and, and a little hotter. But, you know, I, I used to be a career coach, so in one of my former jobs, and so I'd always say, you know, do what you can to – work things out if possible. I mean, no, let's face it. If, if it's not going anywhere, then you really need to look for something else. That's obvious. Right. You know, because I often find, and you know, if we just leave because of personality differences or something without being vocal and really speaking heart to heart with our, you know, direct manager, then we could, you know, face the same challenges and issues in another job. And we just have to learn, you know, to speak up as employees in a respectful manner, you know, whatever, right? Right, right. Having those conversations. I yeah, mean, absolutely. That, that manager may have <clears throat> no idea. He may think it's totally fine. Absolutely. At nine o'clock, which it's not. I mean, we know this, but yeah. they're probably not even aware that that is causing that negative um, turmoil with this employee. And then the employee's going, I, I just find that we're not connecting and communicating in the yeah. way. And a lot of that's the psychological safety that's not there in environment so you know and that's interesting because that was another thing that came up in the report i just read by the global wellness institute by millennials especially and they're saying that they want more heart-centered more open communicators uh, in their managers right and they're not finding that and i don't know this you know and i, I don't want to generalize and say all managers are like this because of course that's not the case but 
you know, that's, that's what millennials are looking for today. They want to have that, be able to have that rapport in a respectful professional manner, but rapport with their direct manager and supervisor so that if there's issues, and I call them overwhelms, right, with employees today and what happens then when we have all these overwhelms that we're not addressing, it creates that rain barrel effect where an employee just starts to implode, right? And then we have stress, we go off on stress leave or breakdowns or they turn to substances to cope or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we'd be well served and behooved to working with employees. And when we talk about, you know, that multidimensional aspect of wellness, bringing things in like, you know, communication workshops, right? Into our organizations, right? Yes, absolutely. Right? Dealing with some of the conflict that's there, which no one wants to do, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I look, I think of uh, Zuckerberg, I believe, used to have a no holds barred Friday afternoon meeting with his employees, right? Where he, you know, it's almost like passing around the stick to employees and say, you can share without any recrimination, anything that's on your mind. And just think what a neat place to be in all our organizations if we had that, right? Right. Oh my God. That would be, that's, that's a brave leader that's willing to really yeah. sit there and face it and yeah. really, truly not retaliate. That's yeah, absolutely. And not take, and not personalize it, but say there's something of value to be learned here, right? right. For right. myself, for our organization, for all the employees involved. Right. It makes the organization better. And I think absolutely. Like, absolutely. Like this, right. It's all absolutely. about the organization and driving the business forward in a positive manner. For sure. Now let's take a little twist here. Because I, when I was doing some research, I read that your program was inspired by and developed around Wellcoa's seven benchmarks. <coughs> so Excuse now me. that they've changed their benchmarks, how are you adjusting or are you adjusting? Well... I I really like this question and I'll tell you why. And again, I don't want to sound, you know, like I'm tooting my own horn here because really that's not the case. But when I looked at their principles, because it's been a while since I looked at them and um, I just reviewed them and really our guiding principles haven't changed. And I noticed that when I looked at them again, that they're really directly aligned with their well colors tenants. And I think it really speaks to the talent we had in our advisory group that helped form our programs and the talent um, and skill sets and experience that comes into our program from our ambassadors. And so, for example, um, when I looked at their benchmark around committed and aligned leadership, right? So I mentioned, uh, and I won't go and repeat things, but I mentioned that we're doing an executive wellness leadership program, which our master ambassadors will actually be teaching as a form of an internship. They'll be, you know, interfacing with the managers and senior leaders as part of the facilitators. Uh, So it's a really unique concept. And so really everything we do in our program is to create that commitment, that alignment connection for for those strong relationships, right? Between, for example, our ambassadors and the leaders. And then to start cultivating that, of course, as we talked about within the organizations that we're working with. So, you know, and that's been our premise and our approach all along. So, I, you know, that wasn't really anything new um, for us, for sure, for example. The collaboration and support of wellness, another benchmark of theirs, well, as I've mentioned, our our programs for our wellness champion, our wellness buddies, our wellness committee, training approach, and development models, they all... Um, really are employee focused, employee responsive, employee driven, if you will. And so, you know, that is an area that we really, um, you know, hold as one of our core values. And so that very much aligns with that benchmark of Wellcoa. And then, you know, when I looked at all the others, creating the operating plan, uh, another benchmark of Wellcoas, well, we very much train, especially at the master level, our ambassadors with step-by-step protocols and guidance, toolkits, assessment templates, what have you, even a workplace wellness charter template to go in and work with organizations, first do that organizational audit or assessment, and then start working with, you know, developing a committee. And and one thing I found in talking to wellness coordinators, just as an aside note, and I still got to be, you know, mindful of this with our ambassadors, is sometimes there's a tendency to go in, especially as independents or concierges with an, a client organization, to go in and do it all, right? And, and you get burnout really quickly. So I caution them. I say, you have to go in and build those relationships. You have to form that foundation and it will make such a lighter load for you and you'll get much more engagement in your programs. But when we go in and just do workplace wellness, right? And not with them, we're doing it to them as we often say in that phrase, then that's why we're not getting that engagement because we're going in with the shiny object or the new program that a vendor sold to HR or to a wellness coordinator. And it's not being responsive really and it's not bringing the employees in and that's the difference with our programs is that they have a whole suite of lunch and learns and campaigns but they're all modifiable and so you can pick apart and you can bring it to employees and say okay this is our suite 
what do you want us to serve you with, okay, um, and support you with? And, and they're very much, as employees, involved in the training, the development of their programs right from the grassroots. So that very much is in speaking and keeping with the crafting of an operating plan that Walcoa talks about. And then the, the other one I want to speak to is about the cultivating support of healthy pro- environments, policies, and practices. And I just alluded to a second ago about our workplace wellness charter. And so as opposed to having policy statements or having a policy document, right, that's very um, institutional and authoritarian by nature and just by the tone of it, right, policy, Um, we give them at our master level a workplace wellness charter template. And so it embraces things like the mission, the vision, your core values, how are you going to brand your workplace wellness program, and it's a much more... um, employee and organizational friendly document and a framework that our ambassadors work with, uh, you know, their organizations to begin the development of, you know, a really um, employee driven workplace wellness program, if you will, right, that really is reflective and embraces the organization's unique growth objectives, their mandates and any challenges that they may have on the horizon, right. And this, I really get a strong background in this from working in HR because, for example, we could not do our HR plan years ago until we had, from the top, because we, we worked at the executive level, so we could not do anything until we had all the strategic objectives and goals from the executive. And then we would take that and formulate our HR and organizational goals from there. So there is a bit of a, a funnel approach, right, that has to happen. You know, now one of the things that... Um we talked about it with Coe is the, the, the measurements changing. So they're really encouraging people to look outside of the health assessment and right. health care costs. So how do you measure success? And, and you may not be, but how do you encourage your wellness investors to measure success? Well, we talk about, um, and I sort of, you know, you asked me about a tangible tip. So it's probably one, uh, you know, this is where I had that answer uh, involved, but You're right. You know, for years, we've looked around the biometrics, right? Um, Getting someone's blood pressure down, getting them off medication, cutting those uh, healthcare costs within an organization, the benefits expenses, reducing our uh, stress leaves, what have you. And it was very, um, you know, financial driven, very ROI focused, right? And so now for those who've been involved in workplace wellness, the new um, mindset or or ideology is, is around focusing on the VOI, the value of what our programs are bringing right to the employees but but so it really is is not so much that we want to focus and you know we still obviously need to have our eye on you know are we having any financial gains but with all the fluctuations in healthcare costs and everything today we're starting to realize that to really solely base our metrics around any financial returns there's very few companies and um the rand report and all the others have looked at this you know sideways to sundays and they found that we're really not truly going to have a huge cost savings. So we need to start looking at, are there some other benefits that well, workplace wellness is bringing organizations? And my answer would be absolutely yes. And we see them all the time. And so things like, um, and it comes back to the millennials I talked about in the report, right? Things like having some flexibility around if their child is sick, being able to work from home, right? And so that's what's going to cultivate your attraction and retention uh, with your employees and buy you goodwill and create that loyal employee so that if you do have a Friday night where you need your staff because you've got a project to finish up and to meet a client's, uh, you know, targets, then, you know, that employee is probably going to be more inclined to um, stay on a Friday night and give them their all when they know that they have that flexibility on a Tuesday to skip out maybe to see their child's concert or to go to a child appointment or what have you. So there's a yin and yang, a give and take, right? And so when we have that, that that's the metrics we want to, you know, metrics around, are we keeping our employees? Are they happy? Are they, you know, um, taking less stress leave? Are they you know, is there less sick time? And just incidentally, actually, it's really interesting. Let me see if I can find my notes here on this, because one of our ambassadors, and this is really a good answer here now, one of our ambassadors just did a assessment, sort of a real-life case study, which I was really pleased to see. She did it with one of her of her clients and the, and the general manager commented from the work she was doing. Now she started out working with um, this company and doing a, a boot camp or wellness retreat in Belize. I think she got an extended contract and I, I think it was the same employer, but nonetheless, the GM commented that of the employees that were involved in her program, 
And she works as a virtual wellness consultant. So she does a lot of work with the company. And it's really a, one of the models that we, we coach in our program is how to do virtual wellness consulting with employees, especially for companies that have remote offices to really make it fully inclusive, you know, kind of programming with all their, their locations and employees. So anyway, the GM commented that through her, her work that she has done in the past year with their employees, that there was reduced requests for sick days and reduced hospital visits by some of their employees, that the employees are more focused and making less mistakes with the report. So they're very specific, right, in their feedback, that they're more energetic, that there's less requests for taking time off for doctor visits, which was important because a lot of them needed to keep up their blood work. And um, the employees had some weight loss successes that, um, and also interestingly, the staff were adapting to small menu changes made to their staff menu because they were rolling out some healthier options. And so, you know, when we talk about metrics, right, when we talk about measuring the success, they are things, these are some of the intangibles, I call it, right, that we want to be looking to right? Um, some of this anecdotal, some of it can be captured in numerical metrics or what have you, but um, we need to cast a wide net, right? When we're looking at assessing and evaluating programs and the benefits they're bringing organizations. Yeah. And often asking very open-ended questions and absolutely finding the themes, which I, you know, and, and leaving the questions sometimes not even in general about wellness, but just asking them what, what was the impact on, on your work day or your life or et cetera, et cetera. So it's not so um, specific because sometimes when you ask a very specific question, you're going to get a very specific answer and right. that richness of the open-ended. Yeah. And things like, you know, water cooler chats, doing focus groups, doing, um, you know, things that we train our, in our, in programs with our ambassadors is is you know get your your information from a variety of sources don't just rely on like that static one time a year wellness plan you know survey that goes out right Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. definitely talking to people informal chats are really good yeah absolutely so let's go ahead and and i hope you didn't already give away your tangible tip (laughs) but um leave the listeners with one tangible tip for creating the workplace conditions so for the employees to thrive well I think you know and I'm going to probably repeat myself because I did I didn't give it up but I think it really I can't think of any better answer than and I come back to that um, that Global Wellness Institute report and, and it really impressed upon me the millennials and what what they're looking for now today and so as far as a tangible tip I would say to what we talked about just to sort of I guess to reiterate what I said earlier to the employees, you have a voice, use it, right? And find ways to be that change agent, to champion change, right? Within an organization, whether it's getting involved in a wellness committee, becoming a wellness buddy, becoming a wellness champion, you know, step up to the cause when you're asked to help and do these things. And, or, you know, become trained as a wellness leader if you don't have a workplace wellness program. And, you know, as I've mentioned, we've got programs and, you know, so does, um, so do you, Jen. And so, you know, that and then to the managers and the senior leaders and the middle managers that we talked about is find ways to engage, to be heart centered, to be, you know, um, a compassionate a leader, to show empathy to your employees. Right now, I'm not saying every time they ask to get an afternoon off, you're going to do that, but find ways to open up, to get to know your employees. And that's what the millennials were saying in this report. They want to feel that they matter, that they're cared for. Right. That if the chips fall down, that their employer, their supervisor has their back. And so I think we both sectors, you know, between management and employees, we both have our roles and our jobs to do, right, to to start making this happen within organizations. And really, to me, that's what a healthy organization is, right? When we're there for each other and we, we can coexist and there's that synergy and there's that mutual support and respect, you know, that's that's where we start creating healthy individuals and healthy work cultures. Yeah, I just want to impress that that comment that you just said that they want to make they want to feel like they matter, and mm-hmm. you know, specifically to millennials. And I think that you know, I'm sure you'd agree that goes across to everyone. Oh, absolutely. And I think, uh, yeah, and I read, yeah, absolutely. The the Gen X, the Boomers. The reason I mentioned it was because they did a priority matrix of the two different or the three different groups or two different groups: the Gen Xs and the Baby Boomers, and then the Millennials. And the, the Millennials that um, that struck you know the top priority for them, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely a theme among the, their their generation. But yeah, feeling like you matter. It can really be that simple. Um, and it doesn't take anything. It can be as simple as coming up to them and asking them what they did the night before. You know, you know, what do they do on their summer holidays? Just just treating them like a human being, right? right. And again, I'm not suggesting that managers don't do that, but I think we need to do more of it, right? Yes, yes. And I think we've, I've, I've been a manager, so I, uh, you forget. You just get caught. Absolutely. Up in it's not intentional. So in the weeds of things, right? Right, absolutely. All right, Lisa, let's, let's end and uh, tell people where you can be reached. Yeah, well, thank you. So um, our website is kellywc.com, or certainly email me directly at info at kellywc.com. You can also connect with me um, through our uh, Facebook group. We have a Workplace Wellness Professionals Facebook group. We have a Corporate Health and Wellness Facebook group. And I also have a LinkedIn group called Workplace Wellness Ambassadors. And I'm very active in all those three groups. So Lisa, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, Jen. If you want to make a greater impact on your organization's well-being and influence decision makers to step into the next generation of wellness... Join me and my colleague, Rebecca Johnson, for our new training, Next Generation Wellness from Theory to Practice, starting in September. To get on the priority notification list, go to redesigningwellness.com forward slash impact and influence. We hope to see you there.